Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Brett Tippy Podcast. I'm Brett Tippy, and I'm here with an old buddy of mine, Dustin Adams. Dustin is one of the first big, successful downhill racers from Canada back in the day, um, winning the Canadian Championships a couple times and uh, two third place overalls in the Norba, and uh, was in the Cranked movies and the first few Cranked movies doing some free riding. And uh, yeah, an old Camelot's boy, and has gone on to um, start a successful uh, bicycle brand business uh, with We Are One. And uh, we're here in the office right now, and uh, I'm here with my old buddy, Dustin Adams. How are you, Dustin? Good, buddy. Good to see you. You Thanks as well. Thanks for coming by and uh, having a chat. Right on. Yeah. Thank you. So, you know, it's been a long time since we met many years ago. Um, let, let, let's go back to the beginning, even before, you know, we met when we filmed for Cranked. And, uh, we sh- should we show you one of all the stories? <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't think we want all the stories. <laughs> Yeah, there's, there's there's not a rated R. Yeah, yeah. This, is, <laughs> um, this is a PG one. Yeah, this is PG. All right, but um, let's go with you uh, right from the beginning. Let's let's start at the beginning. Born and raised in Kamloops. Born and raised. Yeah, this is my home. Uh, I tried to leave, but it drugged me back. <laughs> Thought Squamish was going to be a good fit, but it only took two years before I knew the Kamloops water was not. Uh, it was missing in the diet down there, so the yes. pulp mill wasn't there. I was had some lung issues, so I had to come back and get it in my lungs. <laughs> <laughs> There's definitely something in the water, uh, you know, for so many athletes that it counts to be yeah, it's a hot you know, bit. successful. So yeah, I mean, there's a there's a long list. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. Something in the water. We hear that a lot. It's funny. I think it's the easy go to because it's the one thing we all know. Yeah, <laughs> isn't right. <laughs> um. Take us back to the your first bike. What was your first bike? Oh, my my first bike was a, a Raleigh BMX. That was my first bike. Um, my dad bought it for me. I was living in Tumbler Ridge at the time, believe it or not. And uh, come home for my birthday, and I got a, a red Raleigh BMX and a, an oval tubing. It was red and uh, had had um, training wheels on it, and those. Uh, lasted about 30 minutes and it's like dude the problem is these things on the back they're all so he took them off and that was it and you were rolling i was rolling man just cruising the whole hood after that (laughs) it's hard to keep up you know i i tuck my chin to my chest and i lean forward because that's how i roll (laughs) (laughs) oh i can only wait there's gonna be so many good ones You know, you know, you have to end with a joke at the very end. So you oh you, man, you gotta think of a joke for the very end. I don't have any but, good but, ones. But uh, you know, you got you got an hour. Okay, um, that's all I'm gonna be thinking about now. <laughs> <laughs> so that was your first bike. What was your first mountain bike? My first mountain bike was a giant Rincon. Yeah, fully rigid. Uh, Is that a blue one? No, it was it was black with red splatter paint, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, full rigid. Uh, it had. What was it? Three gears in the front, and I believe seven in the rear. So it was like twenty-one speed, which was pretty hot dog back then. <laughs> and uh, full cantilever brakes, uh, smoke and dart tires, and yeah, I, I remember it like, like it was yesterday. The smoke and dart oh, combo, best of the best. <laughs> Still can buy them, man. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, so you played hockey. Everyone in counts played hockey, yeah. and you did some baseball as well. Yeah. Yeah, um, it was a little soccer. Tried to do the team thing. Yeah, yeah, didn't quite work out the team stuff though. Wasn't for me. People were letting you down. Yeah, I, I'm not. Back then, I wasn't much of a team player. I, I kind of let down. I wanted to. I wanted to rise to the top, and I found out kind of my last year of uh, bantam, which I think was 14 years old, that uh, other people on the team weren't trying quite as hard as I was. So it's uh, mountain biking kind of filled that gap really quick. Because you're a competitive dude. I was a competitive dude. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I was very competitive. D- didn't have a lot of friends because of it. <laughs> <laughs> and did you dirt bike back then as well? No, no. no. I, I I had a dirt bike when I was a kid. Um, let me think. Grade four and five, I had a dirt bike. But yeah, no dirt biking at all um, until I uh, I got into racing. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So, from what I understand, um, you did some cross country first, because like, you made your name downhill racing back in your competitive days. But yep. you started uh, with some cross country. Yeah, it was like anything. Uh, well, mountain biking. I mean, I kind of came on in the, I mean, the initials. Not that I wouldn't say the initial stages. I'm not like Tom Ritchie and those guys, but 
you know, the, the kind of the big fly up stages when mountain biking was starting to turn on in the late, early nineties, mid nineties, I guess. And yeah, cross country was kind of the be all end all. And that's where the Olympics were happening. And there was some, you know, some national funding around it. And, and uh, a lot of the guys in the area, that's what we did on the weekend. There wasn't too many dedicated downhill guys at the time. So we went out on really long rides and uh, it was all a part of it. So we, we went up, we went down and uh, we just called that mountain biking at the time. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't really know what it was going to become. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, your first race was the Stake Lake Stomp. I was, yeah. Yeah, my first uh, first cross-country race, the Stake Lake Stomp. It's a local event here that the Spoken Motion, a really cool bike shop in town, puts on or used to put on every year. And I think they still did. They tried to refire it up. But, uh, yeah, it was a cool – everybody came out and kind of – Put their uh, put their hat in the in the um, in the ring, and we saw who was the fastest guy in Kamloops. So yeah, there were some some pretty quick dudes back in the day that came up that race. Yeah, and you were doing it like at, at fifteen or something, weren't you? Fourteen, yeah. 14, 14 was my first race. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fourteen, and uh, I don't know what the heck I did. I think I got like eighth the first year, seventh or something like the top ten or something like that. And everybody thought that was pretty good. So For a young young guy. Yeah, I was stoked. I mean, I didn't know. I had no expectations. I didn't know what racing was about. I just went out and rode as hard as I could, and it was it was pretty cool to to be in, involved in it all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a, it was a good experience. Well, then you went on, and I think you were like um, BC cross country champion. Yeah, I was uh, cross country BC champion and downhill in and, the same year. Yeah, in uh, cadet, it was like before junior, so it was like junior became uh, I think it was seventeen eighteen. The year after that so yeah that was uh, early on and then yeah i raced juniors both cross country and downhill for team canada at, like world championships in 97 and 98 um and after the 98 one i just said the hell this cross country stuff is too hard and i wasn't i wasn't really wanting to try that hard on the bike and downhill i think i had a lot more talent for yeah yeah and found it more fun yeah it was it was just i mean let's be honest it was just easier like it was it was easier for me to do good at downhill than it was to do it in cross country. Okay. Cross country would have been a, you know, it takes a lot of hard work, a lot more than at the time, a lot more than downhill. A lot more people didn't take it as serious, and uh, yeah, the the uphill battle to be at a level that I could have been at or did achieve in in downhill would have been a lot harder. Yeah, you know, for sure. Well, the success you did have got you sponsored. Like I think, if I remember correctly, it was Norco, and um, you rode for Sun. Yeah. Um, uh, you went on, you rode for Rocky Mountain and then eventually Giant. Yep. Um, with some... Yeah, in that order, yeah. Yeah, exactly. You nailed it. Yeah. yeah. It was, uh, yeah, there's a few sponsors in between. Learned a few hard lessons along the way about sponsorship and how to behave as an athlete and um, had some good support and some, some really cool people that had instrumental uh, um, effects on my life. And uh, yeah, I look back on those memories quite fondly. Yeah. Yeah. And at the same time, um, you were asked to film for Crank, the original Crank. And you're in there on your Norco, I believe, and uh, some lines out in Valley View and, and around, and you're hauling in your Lycra. I don't know if I was ever asked. I think uh, what happened, we were living in Juniper at the time, and these yahoos were parked in this black bus, and they are all riding their bikes on the bluffs and everything, and I was like, that looks pretty cool. I should go down there. My mom and dad kept saying, you got to go down there. Go ride bikes with those guys. It looks like they're shooting cameras or something. I don't know. So I went down, and I think... It wasn't Bjorn, it was Christian, was up on the hill, and I come barreling down the thing, and he's like, oh, we just got, what is this guy doing? And he started freaking out in Christian way, and he's like, you gotta get in the film, get him in the film, and that was how it got in. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, just rode by. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I coached that shit, too. It was supposed yeah. to be Richie doing a 360. Oh, did you? And I showed up, and then I said, hey, that was a nice 360, but let's go buy some steeps. Yeah, and yeah. I took him to the Valley View Skating Arena where nice. the, the bike ranch parking lot is. Yeah. And started riding down some gnarly stuff there with Craig Wilson. And then he was like, okay, you're in the movie. Yeah, nice. That's <laughs> deadly. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's cool. Totally that smart. I still, didn't realize that's how you did it. Yeah. I was, uh, I just, there was a line. I think you guys were in that area and I just came down in front of the arena and like kind of no braked it and tried to make it look as fast and cool as possible and thought nothing of it. And then, yeah, they were like, you got to get in here. That was too cool. Let's do it again. <laughs> like, okay. Nice. Go for it. Well, then you filmed, um, was it with Cody Began, your segment, um, for Crank 2? Uh, that's a good question. I don't. I can't remember. I think it was you and then it cuts to Cody Began after. Yeah, I think I did, the same some, I did some shoots with Cody, yeah. Um, I don't, maybe it was... 
God, who is it now? Dean Connard, I thought, was in front of me. A I think that was too. Crank 3, actually. 3, was it? Okay. I can't remember. I'm I'm old now, dude. I don't oh. remember that stuff. Dude, I, I, I can remember, you know, you know, something from those years better than I can, you know, what I had for breakfast this morning. Yeah, well, your skull's thicker than mine. Yeah. <laughs> or why I walked in this room. Yeah, exactly. I don't even remember where I'm here. <laughs> I remember filming with you, actually, one time, um, and... Yourself and Dean Collinridge and I and Richie, we jumped uh, a truck. Yeah. And uh, it was Tom Erickson's truck. Oh, yeah. That was up in Juniper. Yeah. I remember that. I still talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. And like we were the only guys in town to, to hit that jump at that time. Yeah. And well, you guys are hitting it easy. And I was watching going, that's pretty big. And then I'm like, well, I can do that. So, you know, I wasn't much of a jumper. I was more of a descender, you know. Yeah. yeah. But I hit it and I clicked, jumped the truck. And uh, I never used my footage for of jumping the truck, but yeah. I did it with you guys, and yeah. I was I was stoked. <laughs> the old jump, uh, the truck jump, yeah, that was crank two on the sun. That was ninety eight. Was that crank two? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a good year. So yeah. you're Tom honest. was a good guy. I, I miss him. He was a rad dude. I liked him. Yeah, he was yeah. cool. Yeah. He was uh, hard worker. He knew how to run an old Bolex camera. So yeah. <laughs> And he could hike up Remember when we had to strap that thing to our head? Oh, the, uh, the I think we everybody talks about that because it was such an experience. If you didn't ever have to wear that thing, you would never even know. Can you imagine if you could, you know, foresee GoPros to see little light cameras? Sick GoPro, dude. This has got a 12, what was it, a 12 millimeter? <laughs> 16, or 8 millimeter, 8 millimeter. Oh they used to put them on warplanes for surveillance. <laughs> yeah. And wow. it was so loud. Remember how loud it was? It felt like a warplane on your head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you can hear. Don't stop or crash. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, that thing was like 30 pounds. Oh, it was ridiculous. It yeah. would break your neck if you crashed. It probably would have, yeah. Yeah, it was so nuts. I, always, I was always so nervous because he made it sound like I was riding with like a million dollar piece of equipment on my head so I couldn't fuck <laughs> up. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. yeah, that's funny. Um, so you did some free riding. You know, like those are early free ride movies, but you know, you were a racer. Yeah. And um, you went on actually in uh, 2001 and 2002, you were Canadian downhill pro champ. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like you, you had, you know, some good results, but then you were the man in Canada for those years. And I actually saw you, at, was it the Canadian Championships or was it the Canada Cup? At Sun Peaks, and there was a run uh, down the OSV, it's called now, but it was called the Coquihalla Ski Run. Yeah. There was a bunch of big rollers, and I was watching. And when the pros came on, people were doing like one break tap. You know, two brake taps, and then a few of the top guys came down with no brake taps and coasted it. And then you came down and you actually pedaled into it and you hit this double roller gap. Yeah, there's one of the it's like three people ever to hit that gap. I showed that gap to my <laughs> to the guys that work here. They, I think they're gonna run a downhill course down there. They had a plan, and we're like, I'm like, stop at the top. I'm like, do you see this? Like everyone's like, oh, Sam Hill hit it and Jordy Lund hit it, and I'm like. Yeah, I hit it in a race first, though. <laughs> I watched it. Yeah. I, was, I was right there. I'm glad that you're there because no one ever believes you. They're like, fuck, whatever. Sam Hill, he's way better than you. I'm like, yeah, he is, but he never hit that first. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's The truth happened, right? Yeah. That's yeah, that was a, that, that today, I stood at that thing and I went, what the fuck was I thinking even now? It's right? huge. It's huge. It yeah. was so, you pedaled into it and then you went. Yeah. And then you got clean. Backside, and then it went down, and there was like a sharp right, and you hammered the turn, and you were gone. And then everyone was all standing there. We're all just like that was silent that, for a second. Then we're like, ah! That was that Rocky Mountain RM9, dude. Oh. Nine inches of travel to let you do anything, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Spawning salmon out the rear, and <laughs> big fork out the front just had to hold on. <laughs> Hang on, look ahead. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Amazing. So you're the Canadian champ two times, 2001, 2002. But then you went down, and... Um, you know, you actually got third in the Norba. And the Norba, for the people who don't know, was like the North American uh, downhill circuit. It was like the big the big U.S. Yeah, circuit. And that was all the American the, circuit. The big dogs. And there'd be World Cup guys in there as well. Yeah, the one, yeah, yeah. But it, that, was the, that was the big leagues. And yeah. You was, were third twice. Yeah, yeah. You had some good podiums there, some, some good finishes, second places, third places, some fifths, fourths, all of it in between. Yeah, I had some really standout years in 02. One season you were on the podium every race but one. Yeah, yeah, 02. And then 04, my retirement year, I was also same thing as on every podium except for one as well. And yeah. You got, and you got fourth in a World Cup in uh, Durango, I believe, was it? Yeah, uh, in uh, 2001. Durango. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, tell your ride, yeah. You're tell right. your ride. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I stood on that one. I almost won that one. I screwed up the last corner and I was like, I think that's the one that would have set it off for me. But yeah, it was always like a, I was like the bridesmaid way too many times and that was enough for the sponsor. So you were uh, 1.12 seconds behind Steve Pete, who won. Yeah. Yeah. And Fabian Burrell was second. And uh, Cyril Lanya was yeah. third. Yeah, and McKenna was fifth. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it was. It was he just retired yesterday. I know. I was all, I, 20 years later. I, I, I joke about being old, and I'm like, fuck. <laughs> Him and Menar are still going at it. I can't, I can't even use that anymore. <laughs> they got to retire years ago, guys. Come on. <laughs> no, that is hella impressive, man. Those guys to go that long and, and stay fit and, and stay on the top and stay healthy. Like, I mean, to still crack a top 20 at a World Cup and mix, uh, you know, mix uh, shoes and then also win the World Championships in Greg's shoes. I mean, those guys, they're uh, they're my true heroes for sure. That's legendary. It is. I mean, that should go down as, as never to be done again, I think. Probably not. It, yeah, I would be blown away. Yeah. Yeah, especially the speeds that guys are going nowadays. Totally. Yeah. So after these sponsors with Norco and Rocky Mountain and Sun, you, you were actually getting ready. The story is that you were 30 seconds into walking to a, a meeting or uh, an interview to become a rig pig, I think. Precision yeah. drilling. It was, yeah. And you got the call from Giant to be on the, the, the factory pro team. Yeah. So, yeah, Sean Jenkins was a good friend of mine. He ran the Canadian team for a number of years. And we kind of didn't really talk too much after uh, the 2000 season, which was a good season. I, I was you know, a champion here and I was uh, pretty decent in the world championships that year. I had some great finishes and nothing was coming of it. And I was kind of just done with it. I had to. I had to make some money and have a have a life. I was I would have been nineteen nineteen you know, twenty years at twenty years old at the time. And uh, you know, parents are kinda of hounding me to get a job. The you know, Canada wasn't paying anything. We didn't make money to race, we needed nothing. Um, and uh, life kinda of smacked me upside the head. I didn't have a university degree and I wasn't going and I had to look for an option to, to, to catch up and the the oil field was answering. <laughs> unfortunately. But yeah, I was Literally in the uh, precision drilling, um, like, kind of sign-up thing. I was ready to go, and I was going to take the course and everything. And uh, Sean called me and said, I think I got an option for you. So, um, yeah, Giant USA gave me a kind of an all-paid, expenses paid, but no pay um, to kind of prove myself. And it was an opportunity for me to get on the world stage and, and kind of start showing everybody what I was about. And you went and rocked it right away. And you ended up third in the overall in Norva. Yeah, it was probably the the most serious winter of training I've ever had in my entire life, and I came out swinging. And uh, I remember guys like uh, Craig Glass Bell and stuff like that in the U.S. being like, "Why are these these guys hiring these Canadian guys? There, you know, there's jobs to be had down here. These guys are just a bunch of bums from up there." And I like I just used that and like stored it away as the fuel and, motivation. Oh, it was everything I needed. It was like awesome. Yeah, I came out first round, got third place, and. After that, everybody kind of went, oh, okay. Well, like maybe. racing Kurt Verice and Sean Palmer and, and like uh, Brian Lopes and, and yeah, all, all the big dogs at the time. Kvork, uh, you know, all the uh, fast Aussie guys at the time. Yeah, yeah. Like um, Nathan Rennie. Yeah, it was, a, it was a stacked field, man. There was a lot of fast dudes there. Gracia, all of it. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, there wasn't uh, there was and a like, few Euros missing, but it wasn't uh, a slouch field, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah. The real deal. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it was. So, so that's sick. So you had a successful year. Um, you know, third overall in Norba, like I said, on every podium but one. The next year, you had the team trailer car accident with Terry Giannis, I believe. That's right, yeah. Broke we, your scaphoid and hurt your back. Yeah, that one was, um, well, that one there, I was actually, uh, it was a it was a t- two-parter. So we were coming from uh, Snowshoe, West Virginia, and we are driving the truck up to Vermont and got in a massive car wreck. Uh Tara broke her leg, I believe it was, her foot. Uh, mechanic was pretty bunged up, and me and Jared Rando were, like, just shell-shocked. Like, it was it was a bad accident, a really bad accident. It's so bad, like, looking back on it all, like, I think... Another vehicle involved or off the oh, road? Oh, yeah, yeah, we slammed into another vehicle, full-fledged, T-boned him. Like, another truck towing a trailer with, like, a big industrial auger on the back. Like oh. wrote the truck off, wrote everything off, and we were we were buggered up. Like I was, like they talk about PTSD and all that stuff now. Like if this would have happened to some of the current athletes, they would be racing all year. They'd be benched. Like and you race three days later. Three days. No, we were we didn't unwillingly wreck. That's the shitty news that I always I never got to tell it, and I always want to be honest with it. Like we were told, yeah, you got to race. 
Like, it wasn't what it is now, man. Not at all. Yeah, yeah. it was really shitty, actually. The whole thing went down. It was really shitty. It put put me and Jared in a pretty shitty position. And we, yeah, we went out and raced, totally banged up. And, you know, off of fuck, a car wreck that if someone here would have gotten a car wreck like that, they'd be out for years. Um, and, yeah, uh, did that and then went up to St. Anne and raced the World Cup there. Like a complete clusterfuck. I like, and you got 10th. Yeah, but I was... I. Uh, I didn't want to race. I didn't want to be there. Um, I uh, actually qualified 69th out of 70. So I thought I didn't qualify. So I went back to the team house and I gave up. I'm like, I'm done. Like, uh, this is too much for me. And um, Elka Brutzart comes running in. Where are you? Where are you? We got, you qualified. You qualified. I'm like, oh, no, I don't want to race. So yeah, I got 10th and put together something that I didn't think I, I would be able to do. I was in my head all weekend and thinking about that car crash. Wake, rough, of course. Yeah, I mean, but you waking up every body. night thinking about the car crash, thinking about the car crash. It was just horrible. No sleep, no rest. Um, and then flew home and got hit by a car a week later. <laughs> what a string of bad luck. It was. It was a... It was a you're on the road? Thing. You're training on the road? On a road bike or what? Yeah. That's what I remember. Yeah. 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 yeah it was... Uh, and that's what ended it all for me. That that badly wrecked me. Bad bad back and broke my scapegoat there. Yeah. Yeah. That was where I, I it all fell apart. Yeah. Yeah. So I understood that, you know, you had, you thought you had a deal lined up and then you were let, you were told in December that you had no deal lined up the next year and yep. you couldn't go racing because you didn't have the fun, money or, and you didn't have time to go hit up anybody else. Well, yeah. I mean, it's, you do two years of getting paid, I would think, reasonable money i mean we were making uh, about seventy thousand dollars us at the time a year with all of my bonuses from you know the good results i might have made close to a hundred thousand dollars and bought myself a house and you know a car and started to have a life you know like anybody would and should at that point that they're doing good for themselves and uh put myself in a position where it was like this train needed to keep running it couldn't stop i mean it couldn't I mean, I guess I could have sold my house, but I mean, it would have been going backwards in life to prove something that I wouldn't think I'd have to. But yeah, you proved yourself. You got two two thirds in Norbus. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was the top rider for Giant at the time. I mean, none of my none of my teammates came close, not at all. So it was a, a total shocker. Yeah, December. Sorry, we're not going to sign you. And uh, the industry was really tight at the time. It was actually really really tight and. The closest offer I got was to go ride for uh, Mad Cats with Sam Hill. Um, and um, Sean, the team manager there, offered me that. And it was like, we'll give you bikes, but everything else is on you. And I was like, nah, I'm not interested. I just, it just, it was such a, it was Later. such a blow that I was like, I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. And no one around me ever said, you know, don't let this get you down. You know, just take what you can do. Everyone was around me was really like my whole support system, my wife at the time, and was just like, "This is ridiculous. Why would you bother?" I mean, you're you're sacrificing life and limb. You're you're hurling yourself down the mountain. You just got hit by a car, and your your back is kind of buggered up. And yeah, I just made the call. That's it. I'm yeah. done. I don't want to do this anymore. It's not worth it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I'm not. I value my my well being, and I value what I was put forth. And if no one else saw that value, then what am I doing here? Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. And you yeah. had proved yourself. So to, to know that you could, you know, mix it up with the fastest, you know, in the scene at the time, you know, it at least checks off your box. Like, yeah, I guess I was fast. But then if it's not financially worth it and, and worth worth it, then I can see the point. Yeah. And, and I mean, Giant was a, I mean, I don't know. Giant was a shitty team that just was a really shitty program run by a guy that had no support for his athletes and you know we were told to stay in North America and we wanted to compete on the world stage so we only got to go one European World Cup and I was 12th at um, Fort William in, in 02 and I was like this is going good this was you know I was heading in the right direction and I wanted to race more World Cups and there was just no options so to be honest with you, I think it was great for the two two years I was there they you know I got all the support and I was making money but um, it was going nowhere. It was a going nowhere team, and and looking back, and I know that now. But at the time, it was just like it was too caught up in the the good finishes and and um, you know continuing to to do my own like do it for myself more than anything. So yeah, it was just a it was a bad spot. If you were getting those results today, you'd be full hook up, f- flown all over the world to hit all the World Cups all over Europe. You know, wow. it, it would you know it's like yeah. you were you were the first Canadian to really break it onto the world stage in downhill. 
Well, I mean, Andrew Shandra was was before me. I would think he was doing some big stuff in the U.S. Um, you know, some other big big heavy hitters like Dave Watson gave it a try. Um, you know, Gunner like uh, Rob Hewitt. There's some guys that have definitely paved a little bit of a path for me for sure. But um, I think consistently battling with the top guys at the time, yeah, I, I would I would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's that's. Uh... You know, it's tough. But it's I it's mean, a fork in the road, right? And and you, you made your choice and and, yeah. and and walked away from it. Yeah, I have no no. Well, I shouldn't say I have no regrets. It's a bullshit lie. But yeah, it was. I have a lot of regrets. But because you're a competitor, right? You're like yeah. I'm still am. I, I mean, at the end of the day, I uh, I know where I stood, and and I can live with myself with the decision I made because it wasn't the right decision. But uh, you know, I'm here now, and I've got a, I've got a great thing going for me. Yeah. Yeah. So you you got married. I was at your wedding. Yeah. Super fun. <laughs> and uh, that was 2007. Seven, that's right. And, um, you know, you've had a, a couple uh, kids since then, a couple of boys. Yeah, two boys. Um, Levi and Chase. Chance, yeah. Chance, Chance right? Yeah. Everybody yeah. calls him Chase, that's all right. Yeah. He's used to it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you started a, um, a kitchen countertop company. Yeah, way out of left field. Yeah, I did. I was going to be a carpenter and... I found out uh, that wasn't really all of what I wanted to do. Uh, saw these guys installing some stone at a, a house we were working on and started prodding around and turned out there was nobody doing it here in Kamloops and it was all coming up out of Vancouver and I, the, the building uh, market was booming and I, I saw an opportunity and I pounced. Yeah, it was pretty straightforward. It wasn't uh, zero skill, zero know-how. Just went for it. Yeah. Thought I could do it. Taught yourself. Yeah, pretty well. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of like racing, you know? Business is just long hours, and if you're going to dedicate yourself to that, then uh, it generally works out. Yeah. Yeah, a bit of a plan, and you go for it. Well, you eventually, you had 25 employees, and yep. had a successful business going, and yeah. was that seven, eight years, or? Uh, seven years, yeah. I sold it in 2013. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it was good. Yeah, it was a really good business. I was fruitful. Um Learned a lot about business, learned a lot about automation. Um, yeah, it taught me a ton of stuff, how to work with people a little bit better, um, you know, how to sell my my my, um, my skills and, and whatnot and, and uh, garner a good customer base and yeah, learned a lot. Okay. Yeah, it was definitely a positive experience. So after you sold it, I, I seem to remember you went and traveled to New Zealand and Southeast Asia. Yep. For like, not a year, but like almost. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, so when I got hit by the car here locally, it was like, it was pretty bad. And, um, I ended up, you know, settling with insurance because the, what happened and I, uh, I actually lost all that money in a, in a Ponzi scheme. Oh, so man. we agreed at the time, me and my wife, after we sold the business that we were going to take that money and do something that was memorable in our lives and we were never going to forget about it. And uh, we took the kids there, both two and four, and uh, went to New Zealand. Thought we were going to kind of move there potentially, uh, relocate, and uh, took a job at a stone facility there, kind of managing the the shop, and got along with the owner and kind of thought about it a bit. And we both thought it wasn't right, so we kept traveling. And we did uh, all of Southeast Asia for seven months total after that. Yeah, with with little boys, two boys, yeah, two little kids. We call them the deities. We could have sold them so many times <laughs> over. Blonde hair, dude, they, millions. We would have been millionaires for sure. Easy, sold those two kids. It would have been great. But no, did did you feel safe traveling with two kids, or did that make it safer a, because yeah, people were like, yeah. we're not going to bug a family? Yeah, no matter how bad a dude you are, when you see a, a young family, you're not going to mess with them. You could be bad to the bone, and you're going to get up there, and you're going to be like, oh yeah. I'm, they got little kids. They got kids. Let's yeah. see move on. No, it was it was. Uh, what an adventure! Though. Yeah, it was really cool, man. We did uh, Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, um, and it was awesome the whole time. Not one bad experience to speak of. It was absolutely epic the whole way. Yeah, yeah. And so you'd taken time off bikes. You walked away. Didn't ride for six years. Didn't even ride a bike. At all. Didn't for even six years. own a bike. Yeah. The only time I rode a bike in that time when we were in Vietnam and we did a sit at this hotel that had bikes with baskets on it. Yeah. And uh, we were riding around with those things. Yeah. That was the last. I didn't ride a bike. That was it. Yeah. We wow. wanted nothing to do with it. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Crazy. Yeah. That's well. I, if you walk away, you walk away. I, yeah. I, I took a bunch of years off bikes too, but I did bad things and just partied my brains out. 
Um, but when I came back, I came back with a vengeance and, you know, the desire was back. So your desire yeah. came back. No, it was. I mean, exactly. On that trip, it was like a soul search, obviously. What am I going to do next? And the the idea of getting back into the bike business on the business side of things was was intriguing to me. So I had a, a kind of a goal when we moved back. We sold everything in Kamloops, moved to Squamish, and I took a job selling stone for one of the vendors we used to buy from, Caesar Stone, and uh, decided that there was a beginning of a shoulder job where I could kind of moonlight and make decent money and live in Squamish and uh, kind of stick my fingers in the North Vancouver, Vancouver scene and see what was available. Um, and yeah, I stumbled across um, Noble Wheels for that one. Yeah. And did you get a job as the operations manager, but you said, I want to be part of the business? And yeah, I don't know exactly how that worked. Yeah, it was like basically it came in, met Ryan and, and Trevor and I was like, well, I'm not really interested in being an operations manager. I think I have more value than than that for you, and I think it could really help this business out. At the time, it was like out of their base, well, out of Ryan's or Trevor's basement, sorry, and he was it's like, you know, just under a couple, like hundred, just under a couple hundred grand a year in sales. It was nothing major. It was a really, really small enterprise at the time, and it's like if I come on, I could really, you know, get this thing out there, and we could, you can leverage a lot of my uh, my past experience and and my network and we can make a run for it so i you know yeah we inked a deal where i became an owner and yeah we went at it so how did long that last before you said i want to do my own wheels and and nine months nine months i don't do well in teams yeah (laughs) we've established that remember (laughs) that was a good nine months though i'll tell you wow i made it a long time i thought it was gonna be six but nine it's a new record yeah Oh yeah, no. I was uh, yeah. It was just one wrong thing was said, and uh, that's it. Yeah, I'm out. Yeah. I'll make just like the giant thing. Yeah, I'll do my own thing then. Yeah, yeah. So and so, did you call it We Are One from the beginning? Or how did you come up with We Are One for the name? My wife's named all of our businesses. Okay. Yeah. So my my company that I started for Stone was called Hand to Stone, because um, it was like showing, she's got a knack for showing it, showing pride. Yeah, maybe I don't know. Um, she, yeah, she does. And Sherry's, uh, she's a smart girl. She's, uh, she always seems to think about those, those small things that no one really picks up. Um, but yeah, we were discussing it one day and we're like, okay, well, carbon fiber is like a bunch of things coming together and I want it to be inclusive and I want it to be about a team that I can build and I appreciate and bring the right people together. And she said, well, we are one. And I'm like, yeah, I like that. That's actually not bad. It's like not a great brand name. It's not like, you know, like all the, the brands out there today, but it's like that has some legs because it's different too. It was a unique thing. It wasn't, uh, you know, like one out, name. Then. It stood out, right? Yeah. So, yeah, it, it, and it posed a question, what I liked as well. It was like, what is that all about? And so, yeah. Yeah, I kind of like that. So we went with that. Yeah. Well, what I think I find fascinating and, and it's, it's not unique, but it's, it's definitely rare is that instead of going to Asia or Taiwan to get your stuff built, you're making your stuff right here in Kamloops. Yeah. Yeah. Which is like, I didn't think it was possible, but it's possible. 100%, man. It's, You're uh, making it happen. Yeah, I think we've... And the prices are, are good, too. <laughs> like, I don't know how you're doing it, but... It depends on who you talk to. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's really cool. I mean, uh, I saw a lot of... I spent a, I spent some time in Asia when I was with Noble and poked my fingers in a few things. And uh, based on what I learned with the stone business and, and what I saw there, and I, I kind of was like, just makes no sense to me. The big lead times, big lead times. The the costs, the the people doing it, uh, quality control, the quality, the quality control, the headaches, the nightmares we were dealing with, and I was like, this doesn't make any sense. So uh, yeah, did up a business plan, sourced some a fiber supplier, and um, decided the hell that I sold my house uh, in Squamish and uh, sold everything I owned and put it all on black. Went for it. Nice. Started we are one. Wow. Yeah. So we we yeah it's we make be scary. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. For sure. I mean, yeah. It's not it's not a small undertaking. Um, I think everyone everyone I knew told me I was an idiot to do this. There wasn't one person that was like secretly but like scoffing like there's no way this is gonna work. You know that, right? And I'm like, mm, we'll see. A lot of people told me that many times in my life. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> keep keep quit giving me the fuel I need. <laughs> so oh, fire in the gasoline. Exactly. You just filled my tank. I appreciate it. So have a good day. 
No, it was good. Yeah, I mean, it was it was a massive undertaking. It wasn't uh, easy, and uh, I'm really proud that we uh, we can still say that we make everything here. So you take the raw product and you turn it into a finished product. Yeah, take it to market. You do it all here. Yeah, everything. Did you get an engineer that was like from Rolls Royce or something to, to help you with with, with the, the design? Yeah, our initial engineer was uh, um, Fraser. Uh, he uh, came from Rolls Royce. Uh, smart dude from from England. Uh, well, he's actually from Scotland, but he trained and, and did uh, his schooling in England. Um, really nice kid. He uh, he came up and we originally did the the molding and the tooling together with him and uh, our That was for the still. original the, the agent will. The agent. Yeah, the very first one, July 2017, so, June 2017. Yeah. Yeah. Mind blowing. Yeah. Yeah, we went from like that was so many good stories along the way. Like the first time we did this stuff was just like, oh my god, what did we get ourselves into? There was a lot of long sleepless nights and and aggravation, but yeah. Fraser kind of helped us out. He uh, he brought a lot of his his technical prowess to the team, and uh, yeah, he's still dearly missed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a good dude. Yeah, oh. he left us in 2018. So hmm. yeah, working for Race Face the bugger. Oh yeah, <laughs> we won't hold that against him. <laughs> um, so you were trying to iron out some of the the manufacturing hiccups that you saw, you know, in, in previously, and uh, you know, like. From what I understand, a lot of stuff is made and then it's like sanded and fixed after, you know, cosmetically and you lose your structural integrity if you do that, right? Yeah, you want it to be yeah. perfect and you want it sellable right out of the mold is from what I understand. Yeah, yeah. Is, is, is that the, my, the... Yeah, the principles of my business plan were we needed to cut out 80% of the labor and 80% of the labor came post mold. So that means once the part came out of the mold in China or Asia... Um, it, it was flawed or it faulty. was flawed and needed filling and needed sanding and needed painting and needed re-sanding and repainting and repainting and all this messing about to get it to a finished product and of which you couldn't guarantee was a good quality product based on what we had learned in, in, in our steps leading up to that so problem number one to solve was how do we cut out all that labor so we went out and we sourced out different bladder molding techniques different bladder material we sourced out uh, you know, better carbon that allows for, for a higher compaction uh, with lower pressure. There's all kinds of things we tested along the way and, and uh, before we got to our final our final recipe for the agent. But um, yeah, the first time we popped it out of the mold and it was just like clean off the flash lines and drill the holes and that was it. Um, we knew we had something we achieved for sure. And did you also like try and figure out how many times you can use a mold before you have to... to to redo it and yeah yeah i mean our our like a typical aluminum mold nowadays we'll get about 1500 rims out of it before we have to retool it so it's for us at the time it was way beyond our capacity would ever have been at the at the starting point so yeah it was no problems hmm. yeah wow okay and now also i i was doing some research and you know you're trying to line up all of the fibers because if, if they get bunched and then it's like stronger there and you don't get the resin to all the same places it's not even and yeah it's, it's you're lining up all your your fibers so that they're strong everywhere and consistently yep. strong yeah it's, so it's like a carbon fibers only strong in in long elongated runs well i shouldn't say only but it's it's the where strongest. it shines is when it's elongated perfectly and there's no uh we call wrinkles or kind of speed bumps along the way let's say it's yeah. just going straight so if it flies in a straight arrow that's optimal um and uh fraser and me we worked on a lot of the engineering for the for the laminate for the rims and um we still to this day i think um have a great product based on that that premise for sure and yeah. that's just working on fundamentals of what the product uh, does best yeah yeah and i and i, and I understand that the, the repeatability of making a product with, with plus or minus two grams and then the China standard is like 15 to 20 grams. Yeah, plus or minus 15 grams is what we used to get um, when we were dealing with vendors there. Um, and now we're, we're yeah, plus or minus three grams and we're good to go. Two grams, yeah. We, we'd hit a super tight tolerance and we repeat your uh, day after day. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's, that's high quality. That's how you maximize the strength for the weight. And yeah, I mean, there's a lot that goes into it. I mean, I spent a lot of time on process center engineering and you know uh, SOPs to make sure that people are, are operating and then doing what they need to do and how to do it and it's easy to train to get them to do it um, yeah it was uh, it's been a long 
struggle to get to where we are now, but um, I think onboarding people now and generally about two weeks, they can start making good quality product that we can send to the market. Yeah. Yeah. And how do they ride? Like, like you know, you, you, the problem with the carbon rims in the beginning is they made them too stiff. Like they, they were like radially stiff mm. and, and you want them laterally stiff. And so how did you make make them laterally stiff without making them radially stiff so that they had some compliance and they could actually don't bounce you off the trail? Like, yeah, how did you find that balance? Um, I think just having an, I mean, with my background, I'm pretty intuitive of how a bike should feel and what the positive effects are. And I think just tuning the laminate uh, in orientation and, and in shape uh, to getting exactly what, what we felt was like the optimal amount of stiffness and, and the optimal amount of compliance. Um, into the rim, we, we don't like to use that word by the way. Compliance, it's one of those ones we it's like 10 beers if, or a case of beer if you say that word. Oh, really? Shop. Yeah, 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 it's a buzzword. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, no, it's uh, I mean, the radial stiffness of the tire and so that the f- doesn't feel rigid and, and beating you up. Um, it was just something that we, we played with, you know, on the trail, really. It's not really something you can quantify on test rigs um because it's a feel it's not uh it's not quantifiable it's 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 tactile what, yeah. are, you, what are you feeling when you're riding it do you remember N- nicholas Fayot used to like try different wheel sets with like different tension spokes yeah. and he really played with that a we lot did that too yeah 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 it's huge i mean that's a t- if it's big big um outcomes for sure yeah yeah he was the, he was the he was the master of that that guy used to fiddle around with his bike and no one knew what the hell he was doing yeah yeah it was great he was just go off on his own little world over there and his own tent and they the would alien. fiddle around. Oh, he was crazy, man. Yeah. I, uh, I wish I was paying better attention than focusing on racing because that guy had so much to teach for sure. Yeah. Could have learned a ton from him. Yeah. Just by watching. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so your product is strong. It's light. It's got the right amount of flex where you want it. Um, you offer a lifetime warranty. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. I always have. Or sorry. I shouldn't say it. Not always have. We did as soon as Santa Cruz did. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, yeah? You're like, okay. They started it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they started it. I want to clarify. <laughs> they started it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, yeah. D- d- will that come back and bite you in the ass? Or like, no. I mean, we... we uh, we're not a high volume player, obviously. We we manufacture uh, twelve to eighteen thousand rims a year right now, um, and our warranty rate is still sub one percent. So it's uh, very very low. Um, we know our product is great, and we offer a lifetime warranty. Um, it's a no questions asked warranty. If we would say the disclaimer of a manufacturer's defect, as in like we we did something wrong. Um, 80% of those products that come back broken to us um, are would fall under the not covered because that's not a manufacturer's defect. Yeah. I th- I'd like to say that I a lot of our a lot of the people that ride our product are at the upper end of the crust. They push the bike harder than anybody else and anytime we generally get a warranty is like, yeah, dude, I screwed up. I did this like 15 foot drop and came up short on a rock and you know, anything would have broke you like, and it comes back and there's just a small crack. You're like, well, that's not that bad. So yeah, most of the time we see stuff like that and we still cover those. Um, it's very, very minimal damage from, uh, from rider air more than it is our problem. Yeah. So that's yeah, awesome. stoked on that. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Gonna make you feel good. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I would love to solve those 80%, but, uh, that's for, that's, that's what we're working on now. Yeah. And, and you, you, you're working on and have them sellable right out of the mold. Like, yeah. so there's minimal, things to do after it it's there it is it looks good yeah it's strong it's good to go so like, yeah our post mold process is drew is deflash and drilling and it takes uh three minutes to deflash and eight minutes to drill that's all we do so we spend about 45 minutes to lay up one rim um and eight minutes to get that rim ready for uh, wheel build okay yeah so it's pretty cool and um like not crazy graphics all over the thing, you know? No, never. We wanted to do super subtle and we started with our, our what we call our chevrons and we've always stuck with that and uh, that's kind of where we're going to stay for sure. Yeah. yeah. We don't plan on being loud. Okay. And now I noticed you've got all these different wheels. Like now you have the, the Revolution wheel set. Yeah. And you've got the Union, the Faction, the Revive, the Coupe, the Strife, the Convert. What, give us a quick breakdown of what, what these are. Yeah. So I think starting at the top is our union one. It's our 30 millimeter internal. Uh, we've done a two seven and a two nine. That's our kind of 
enduro tough guy rider wheel that uh, rides trail. He does a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and kind of dabbles in all aspects. Um, then our factions are two nine only. It's our trail dedicated rim, so it's a lightweight uh, four hundred twenty gram rim that's uh, twenty seven mil internal. Um, then our revive is our gravel wheels uh, rim. Sorry, it's a twenty five internal nineteen mil depth. Um, that's a 380 gram rim and that's a really cool rim actually for gravel it's like bc gravel take talk of compliance buzzword here uh it uh is really really good for gravel there's no staff here right yeah now. Yeah, yeah i don't know any beer <laughs> they're gonna catch me after this is getting recorded uh but yeah that's uh good for bc gravel like we 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 say bc gravel because you know if you've ever been on a bc gravel road you know that washboards can get pretty bad and that really really helps for that so it's a cool rim for that uh, our coup is the our twenty six inch because it's never gonna die, right? It's never gonna die. There's no. always gonna be someone yeah. out there on so, twenty six, and that's strong for look at Rampage. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's uh, you know, guy like um, Jackson Riddle was riding that uh, the last two years uh, on all of his bikes, and you know, sending it like crazy. But it's also a sick uh, dirt jumper, and Brett Reader runs them, and uh, um, a few of the top DJ guys that are out there killing it are running that rim. So. It's a really good rim. Uh, we still love it, and uh, it's doing well. And yeah. then our Strife is our downhill version. It comes out of the Union mold, so same mold, uh, same specs, but we uh, do a downhill uh, version of that. And then um, our Convert is our 35 millimeter, so our, a wider um, um, inner inner width, and that's used to be for plus tires, but it works really good for like two six to two eight. Yeah, really good for e bikes. That's something we're gonna probably shove into that e bike market. Oh wow! Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Well, there's great reviews on them. Like pe- people swear by them, and like the pink bike comments are notorious for being <laughs> super bloodthirsty. Oh, pay those guys with so much money to say that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just Dolly no, like, no, God. I think our last month when we had that one was like seventy grand. We had to pay out in comment fees. <laughs> I love how that gets brought up. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. Um, so the wheels are are killing it. That was your initial product, but um, you know you do some other things too. Like I, I see a bunch of different things that you're selling on on the website, but uh, what what caught my eye was the the package, and you've got um, the bars. You gotta say stem. that in a Newfie accent when you say it. That's what it comes from. The package. The package by. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, full blown. We had two Newfies working for us at the time. Is that how it started? 100%. Come on. Everyone says duh, like the dust. And I'm like, no, it has nothing to do with me. It's the package. It's like full blown Bayman. You got to be Newfie accent if you say it. That's as Canadian as it gets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love it because no one ever realizes. They all like, I don't get it. What's the package? I thought it was just they came together, right? No, no, dude, they work together. It's the buys. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> I, no, I honestly thought it was together because, like, you know, in, 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 instead of like a thirty-five or, or a standard, it, it's a thirty-three. Yeah. And then you got like a what is it, like a sleeve, oh, uh, anti crimp anti-crimp sleeve. sleeve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It goes together like uh, like cod and screech. Yeah. <laughs> Laverne and Shirley. Laverne yeah, and Shirley. <laughs> Lauren Hardy. There you go. We're date, I'm dating myself here. Yeah. <laughs> Starsky yeah. and Hutch. There you go. Um, but yeah, no, we, we designed that in, in unison with uh, Giacomo from 77 Design. He owns a really cool um, component company and, and actually a bike company now, Cavenz, um, in Germany. He came to us with the idea and we liked it and we made some tweaks to the design and kind of gave our two cents and um, we went to market with it and... Uh, yeah, it's really cool. Our stem is like uh, seven or sorry, eighty-two grams, which is crazy light it's really for the light. forty-five mil one, really which is light. like nutty. So the and that's seventy seventy-five aluminum. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a really really good product. Um, we just can't make them fast enough. That's our biggest problem. They're always out of stock, so I don't wow. even know the last time they were in stock. To be honest with you, really, like yeah. the, the thirty-five mil or more of the forty or both? No, just the, the whole thing. Yeah, really. It's just we, yeah, we we have like this like kind of backroom situation where if, if we like you maybe we'll sell you one yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not really good business practice or like but yeah whatever <laughs> so we got this product let me tell you about it They're talking to the board of directors yeah that go over well yeah yeah no no it's uh, i mean it's it's just a we have to work on our our speeding that process up because it is a really really technical layout um to make it such a good product and we can't really sacrifice a great product for speed yeah, yeah, we're not gonna give that one up. Oh wow! Yeah, 
Wow, that look cool. You know, you've got your five degree up sweep and eight degree back sweep, which you yeah. know is a good good yeah. feeling bar. You know, thirty five, uh, twenty seven and a half and a twenty mil rise. Yeah, yeah, it's a great product. Um, which one do you use the most? Twenty seven and a half. Yeah, yeah, I'm right in the middle. Yeah, I like a little bit of a lower stack than most people. Um, and um, so yeah, you get your better pull on that. Yeah, I get over the front and I attack off the front of the bike more than more than most people are comfortable. Yeah, I think it comes back from a, a skiing instructor used to tell me. I come Press down. the front of your boots. Well, he said it differently. <laughs> I was coming down the hill and he was watching me. It was like we we're doing a backcountry heli day, and he goes, "You suck at skiing." I go, I don't, "I don't, I don't know. I'm having fun." He goes, "Yeah, you're sitting back and shitting on it. You got to stand up and fuck it." <laughs> so, yeah, that's, I like to say that's what I do on the bike now. <laughs> fuck it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, you have to cut that part out, maybe. Uh, no, that's funny. <laughs> it's a bit to be podcast here, everyone. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I thought we had rules. Well, a little bit PG. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Frigate. Yeah. <laughs> so, you've got these different things. The rumor around for years is that you're coming off the bike. You were prototyping a bike. I know Dave McKinnis. He, oh, boy. He hinted to me, you know, that something was coming down the pipeline. And then it's been released. The arrival... Of the arrival, yep, 150 millimeter carbon fiber enduro bike, mm-hmm. and um, you know you, you've got Jonathan Helly, local ripper. I used to go to high school with his dad. Yeah. Oh, Jesus, Frank, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we were in awesome. the same homeroom. Oh no way! And uh, he was a dirt biker back then. Oh yeah, he still is. Yeah, yeah. and uh, he's an awesome guy. But his son is a ripper, and he's yep. getting top 15s and EWSs and junior. Yeah, or U21, sorry. Yeah, and um, first year this year. Yeah. yeah, he's doing really well. So Dave McInnes, who was my mechanic forever down in uh, Deep Cove, yep. North Ann, sorry, um, is mechanic came for him and Jacob Took, I think. Jacob Took, yeah, yeah. So they're uh, they're riding the bike right now, the EWSs this year, and um, yeah, they're both great little athletes. And we, uh, I made the. I made the the idea, the plan. I guess I don't know what you want to call it, but um, we were going to keep it local. Um, you know, little cam loops in the interior. We see a lot of kids get overlooked um, by the, the 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 upper elites in in Vancouver on the bike scene and in the Whistler, 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 Whistler. Yeah, they all get all the love, and none of these kids get a shot. And um, I because you were believe, you were that young Counts kid yeah, once too, right? Hundred percent. And I, I I experienced the same thing these guys are experiencing. You know, that was not in the in the. Well, you know, you left cam loops and you went to Vancouver and. You know, you, you, you shone down there and you did well. And, um, I stayed here and I didn't, <laughs> so I don't want that to happen for these kids. I want to give them a shot and, uh, our company, uh, being based in Kamloops, we want to have some interior Okanagan kids, uh, and give them a, an opportunity to go out there and race at a high level and, and prove that, that, uh, there is talent around these woods. Yeah. 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 It's awesome. Yeah. And the bike has been well received. I just read the uh, pink bike test where it was yeah. in a shootout. Yeah, it blew me away. Yeah. And they are stoked on it. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I love this product. It, uh, it's, it's everything I ever thought it would be. I'm, I'm really, really uh, happy with what we've put forth. Um, we, we labored over every last waking detail on that bike, um, and I couldn't be happier. Right down to the titanium out. bolts. Yeah, I mean everything. There's. The, I always say, like, you just look at it. Put it next to any other bike and just look at it and look at the, the fine details that we've put forth and the shapes, the, the angles, the the design, um, the carbon laminate that we've put forth in there. No one seems to want to talk about that because it's, like, just a bike. But, uh, you know, we cut a lot of bikes apart to, to reverse engineer them and learn about them and whatnot. And it's a much different beast than what we're seeing today um, from any manufacturer. And... Um, yeah, I'm. I'm really excited about this project. It's it's gonna put the whole company into a, a new, a new realm, and we're no longer just a bunch of rednecks putting carbon into a mold. Where uh, I think we we uh, shot over the bow there, and I think people now you're high tech rednecks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we drink fan. We we pinky up when we drink our tin. Yeah, <laughs> pinky up with a shotgun. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, this bike does look amazing. It looks awesome. Um, what, what I thought was interesting was your sizing. Yeah. You've got your CZ1, CZ2, uh, or S, sorry, SZ1, SZ2. It's so hard, I know. Five foot three to five foot eight for the SZ1. Yeah. Five foot eight to five. You can no, just five three it. to five eight, five eight to five eleven for the medium, the SZ2. Yeah. And then five eleven to six four for the SZ3. Yeah, yeah. 
So we, we did that SZ numbers, and I think you're starting to see that across the industry because it, its sizing is so difficult. You have to really, if you really wanted to get on a bike and take it serious and look at it, you got to look at the numbers. Uh, the numbers tell you a lot. Your, your, your geometry should tell you if you're going to fit this bike not or not. And if you're going to spend that kind of money on a bike, you should really be getting steered in the right direction. So it doesn't cut the mustard to do, we don't do a small, we do a medium, what we would call a medium, a large and an extra large. And we call them the, S, the SZ, so size one, size, size one, two, size. and size three. Okay. Um, and we want our customers to really look at those numbers and make sure they're making the right decision on the right size and it gives us the opportunity also to help them out um, you know a lot of guys we've seen already that are yeah I've always been a large always been a large always been a large and you get some measurements off them and I'm like I think you're going to fit the you know the, the, the XL or the medium differently this is going to be better for you and they get the bike and they're like yeah thanks I, I never would have thought this is much better and so it's because you get stuck in a rut and, yeah. and doing what you've always done right yeah and the industry yeah, I think is stuck in a rut they think it shouldn't be that way I think it should be you know you know a size not a, a one two three not a small medium large because it's too generic it's too you know starbucks mcdonald's to, to do that yeah yeah so your size one is a 450 mil reach and yeah. then uh the two is a 475 and a 500 yeah that's right and uh what do you, what do you run how I, tall are you i am five nine and a half five ten ish right in there depends if you're blonde and tall i'd say six <laughs> 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 Joke. Uh, camera. I'm talking about my wife. She's... The camera has a couple inches. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I ride the uh, I ride the SC two. So okay. I ride our our large. Yeah. Um, yeah, four seven five stack with a forty five mil stem and a twenty seven and a half mil bar. Um, a one fifty mil dropper. Um, yeah. Because I'm never really like my seat being right out of the way. I like it kind of between my legs to feel the bike. Yeah. And I can plant my. My thighs is where I need them to, to help me stabilize yeah, and steer. Um, so, yeah, I run that with a union in the front. Or, sorry, union in the rear and a convert in the front. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a cool little thing. I like the convert up front. It gives you a little bit wider contact patch and some more volume in the tire to kind of ease up the, the, the small bump compliance and give you some um, better feel on the traction or better feel on the front end for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And you've got a 148 boost crank set? Yep. Yeah, we did a different thing. I think I want to say we're the first company ever to do it. We went with a a boost front crank and then a one five seven in the rear, super boost in the rear. And what that did is is what we did. We did a, a kind of like an a assessment with the SRAM's axis. Yeah, I rode it for a year and kind of got the data of where I was sitting in my gears riding my bike. I was generally all mountain riding, so you know, uphill, downhill, trail riding, um, and found that I spent most of my time in, in my first to my ninth gear. That was where I was spending all of my time. So it made no sense to have the chain line be kind of tucked to the left so your chain line's bad. We wanted to bring it out more. But to do that, the industry has always said, well, you got to change your cue factor. So as your rear cassette comes out, your chain ring comes out as well. So it's just kind of defeating the purpose. You get marginal gains. So we figured we could design the bike so that you had optimal chain line from one to nine and then it starts to actually kind of do what you see in one two three right now on most bikes you'll start to see the chain kind of flex a bit yeah so in our uh i guess it would be 13 11 and 12 it kind of starts to bend the other way so those gears that you don't really spend a lot of time in unless you're going downhill yeah um so yeah yeah we decided to do that and and yeah we're really happy with the outcome you'll see a lot less chain wear um and the cassette will last a lot longer too so not wearing the parts as hard either so even drag too you don't see as much drag on the bike yeah uh, i think that was in the pink bike comments was about how how well the bike climbs so yeah um, climbs exceptionally well for a 150 bike yeah amazing yeah wow good for you like who would have thought back in the day that you know i don't need any sponsors i'm gonna sponsor other people <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean Making a bike was uh, was on the priority for us since day one. It was a part of the five year plan, and uh, we're a year ahead on on that plan. And um, it's yeah, it's super cool just to to be able to go down to the shop and be like, let's just make this, and you make it. Yeah, and it's like oh well, I'm cool. Instead of buying it, you just just make it. You just have to have the tools to do it, and you can do it. It's yeah. really cool. It's such a cool business to be involved in right now. 
Um, it's ever evolving and, uh, yeah, I can't wait to make the next, uh, rad thing for sure. That's amazing. How many, uh, this is a huge building here and I, I've been over the one in Valley View. Um, how many employees do you have at We Are One? We're at 75 and we just hired a young kid from uh, high school to clean the garbage after at one. So 76, 76. and a half. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cause he's going to take up that much more time. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a it's a pretty big company uh, or medium sized company. I think from where we were um, since the explosion in our industry, we've hired over forty people in the last year and a half, wow. um, and yeah, moved into two other facilities. We're operating out of just uh, just under twenty thousand square feet right now across the three facilities. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's rolling. It's rolling. Yeah, it's it's rolling, and I I think at this point I'm confident that will continue for a long time. Yeah, yeah. Do you have plans for doing like a downhill bike or an e-bike? Or oh, yeah, many more bikes. Yeah, Many yeah. more bikes. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, we'll, we'll have a full suite of bikes. Um, I think next year we have plans for two um, and potentially a downhill bike. So three full bikes next year for sure. Crazy. Yeah. 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 So it'll be four and then for the just stars. keep going. Wow. Yeah. Why not, right? Why not? Got nothing but time. Wow. I love it. Um, I want to talk quickly before, before we wrap things up here, like something that happened to you last year. You've done a lot of crazy things. You've raced at, you know, World Cup levels, been on the World Cup podium. You were riding a trail up at Harper, and an easy trail, and you had a crash. Yeah. Riding with your kids, and you ruptured your spleen. Yeah, dude. That was, that was an odd day. Which is, which is a quick moment, you know, um, you're sponsored by Ride Route. And I'm supposed to talk about the Ride Wrap crash of your life. Oof, Ride Wrap crash. That was Ride Wrap crash of my life for sure. Yeah. Well, the crash, maybe not. Injury, yes. We can talk about the Ride Wrap crash of my life because it happened last year as well. <laughs> yeah. Ride Wrap crash of my life was uh, up at Greenstone a month before I lost my spleen. Oh, yeah. And uh, going down these like kind of whoop de doo G out kind of like. Uh, roller coaster woo, come up the other side and turn and go back down the other side and there's this new trail and I was riding with Chris Shepard and Sean Jenkins yeah and I'm out the in front bros. and having a good time and I come down to the bottom just barreling down this hill and it's just this harsh G out up the hill and before I know it that's it I don't remember anything lights out I guess did they tell you what happened yeah so I caught a, a up like a like this big a post six inch post out of the ground on the side of the trail clipped my a trailing foot and stopped me dead and I was just at the bottom and I just lawn darted Hit pile the ups, drove my up, up yeah, into the upslope and just splayed up the upslope um, yeah I just don't remember any of it open face on it yeah 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 big huge gasher in my face and um, out cold had a bleed on my brain yeah really bad concussion I was I'm still dealing with the symptoms from that but yeah then a month later out riding with the kids and Decided I didn't need a spleen anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and what what happened? Did you just I, the same thing? Just oh no! Hit a tree. Yeah. Clipped a tree. Yeah. Down, down. Like, you know, when you're riding and you're not thinking, you're like, uh, we were. I was riding the the prototype, and I was like, kind of like, oh, what's what am I feeling? What am I feeling? What's this thing going on here? Trying to be like attentive because the kid's out in front of me, and I'm just kind of tooting around with him. Yeah. And I'm like thinking about the bike as I'm riding, and then the last thing I know, I clipped the clip the bars or something clip something and i'm going over and i'm like oh no and i went down and I, it was, when i hit i felt like a you know when you pop a balloon in your hand you got that pop feeling yeah i felt like that inside just like, in your guts yeah just poof and i was like as grape lady and i was like hey, oh. hey. <laughs> but i've had it so many times you know you're like okay it'll come back it's coming back just yeah. relax you know i've been here before this, yeah. is, this is the racket it wasn't coming back and then I was like, what the hell? And I was like thinking, and I hopped back on the bike and rode the rest of the trail down to the bottom. And I was like, got to the, the bottom and everybody was there. My mechanic and a few people were testing with that day. And um, I laid down on the road and I was just like, ah, and like get in the truck, we're going. So yeah, drove me to the hospital and I showed up and I, they like, I walked in and the lady's like, uh, you can wait right there. I'm like, no she's like yeah you wait right there I'm like I am in big trouble I need to see a, a doctor right now and she wouldn't she wouldn't let me go she made me sit there for five minutes before I got in and I got in and the guy's like triaging me they I passed out in the chair they red lighted it all and I was bleeding like <laughs> profusely 
Lost yeah. five units of blood. Five quarts. Yeah, yeah, bleeding, just just puffed up. I had like the, they took my shirt off, and I was like, Brr. I was like, holy crap, God, you could have died. I know. Yeah, it's another big plug for the R N H. Yeah, <laughs> Jesus. So they saved your life, and oh yeah, they had blood, luckily for you, and and match your blood type. Yep. Incidentally, my blood type is gravy. <laughs> I don't nice. know if that's gonna ever... turkey or beef. Yeah. Beef, <laughs> nice. <laughs> Mine's turkey. <Yeah. laughs> Luckily, I had five quarts of that. I'll take five quarts of that right now. <laughs> that's easy. <laughs> Wait for Thanksgiving. If you want some turkey with that? <laughs> no, I'm just gonna go for the gravy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but one of the guys uh, from We Are One organized a blood drive for, yeah. uh, for the Canadian Blood Services. Yeah, Dustin and Windross. Yeah, Dustin Windross, and then they had like 53 first-time donors come out right away. Because a lot of mountain bikers use a lot of blood, but they don't give a lot of blood typically. And you guys gave a lot of blood. Yeah. Um, it's a way to give back and, and to help any mountain bikers that might need it in the future. Yeah, it's it it really speaks volumes to our, our organization, to be honest with you. I, I didn't really catch wind of it until the very, very minute uh, that it all went down and everyone was leaving. And I was kind of like, what's going on? They're like, oh, we're doing a blood drive. I'm like, what are you talking about, blood drive? And I said, well, you know, we're going to give back for all the blood you took. And I'm like, What? And I was shocked to find out that. You're like, uh, I'm still using it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 50, 51 of our guys went up there and gals went up there and gave blood, uh, uh, you know, in my behalf and and um, blew me away. Yeah. It was really, really amazing. Yeah. yeah a couple cool. guys even then, I think in the industry, have have reached out and said, yeah, I gave blood this week. Thanks a lot. This was a good kick in the ass for me to go and do it and uh, got to do it more often. So, yeah. yeah, you take these things for granted. I mean, I did full blown. And um, I never thought I would have needed it or anything like that. And you never know, right? Here I was, boom. Yeah. Without it, I would have been dead. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank God you're not. Yeah, it was. It was amazing. Yeah, could get on the doctor. Yeah, yeah. Well, whatever you do, don't ever go see Doctor Acula. Dracula. Dracula. <laughs> Acula. Dracula. <laughs> I couldn't help it. Yeah, yeah. Oh wow. Well, I'm glad you're alive, and you know, I um. You know, it's been a friend a long time, and you, you don't know when things are going to happen, and when they do, it's like, it's always happened to someone else, right? And you're a good rider, and you think, you know, I'm not doing anything gnarly, and then that's when it gets you. Yeah, it does. It, you, I think that's exactly it. I think if a lot of people looked at some of their bigger crashes, it was probably because they weren't paying attention. Yeah. For me, I mean, both of them. Yeah. Yeah, last year was, was a big, big year for that, for sure. Yeah. Well, it sure makes you take things. Um, you don't think don't take things for granted when something like that happens. And yeah, I've slowed down immensely because of it. Like I, I was I had aspirations of doing some enduro series stuff this year and whatnot. And I'm like, nah, yeah, I'm done. Yeah, I'm I'm actually officially. I'm a dad. I'm gonna push it. Never. That's yeah. how I, That's how many times I'm gonna push it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna ride my bike. I've walked things this year that I never would have in the past. I've like turned around on yeah it stick the wind right out of my sails yeah yeah probably for the better we rode actually in the north shore you came out and did a night riding video when you first came back to biking and uh you killed it you know we were riding with adriano di decento and and um dave mckinnis and myself and we're riding some north shore in the the middle of the night and you were ripping and i was like i thought he had ridden forever and you were ripping yeah that was the first time i'd ridden and well not the first time but was a, a year fresh, back yeah. or whatever, very fresh after like yeah. six or seven years off. Yeah. And I'm like, let's go night riding. We'll meet, meet it at 9 p.m. And you're yeah. like, okay. Yeah, why not? We got and nothing then else to do. We made a cool little video. Yeah, I remember going, it was like, what do they call the top of that? It's not Ned's, but it's like all those ledges at the top in Seymour. Oh, uh, you incline. Go, incline. I died. Like, I'm like, that's insane. Down that little bike oh, down there. Yeah. In the dark. I couldn't see anything. I was last. I was like, I went down. I was like, oh my God, what did I get myself into? <laughs> <laughs> so scary. That's right about my house. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, man. That was nuts. Well, I'm glad to see you biking again. And, uh, you know, very, very um, stoked to see you with a successful business. And cool. um, see all the people that are stoked on your product, which yeah. makes got to make you feel good as well. And... Uh, yeah, yeah, it's good to be a part of it again back in the industry. Yeah, uh, you know, I swear my heart really lies. So yeah, stoked. You're you're dire. You're a life for Mount Baker. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to go anywhere else. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't be good at flipping burgers. I know that. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> that's part of the team. <laughs> you know what my favorite burger is the Zen burger, one with everything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 
Wow. Well, thanks for coming on the show. Nice to have a word with you. Yeah, finally, buddy. It's been a long time. Yeah. Uh, I was, uh, I was, you hit me up a while back, and I'm glad we can finally connect. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Before we go, though, um, do you have a do you have a joke? We, we always end with like a, a dad joke, a, a dirty joke, any kind of joke, just to uh, kind of like a custom. You know what? The, the, the world's changed. We don't do jokes anymore. Well, maybe not those kind of jokes. No, just any jokes. Is like everyone's nervous? I don't know. I honestly have nothing. I like thinking. I'm like, I can't even remember the last joke I heard. I, just, I got nothing. I got one for you. You give me a good one. Give okay. Me a okay. So you, 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 me you started. We are one. Yeah. You know, started this new business. I have a neighbor who started a new business, mm-hmm. building sailboats in his garage. Mm-hmm. Sales are going through the roof. <laughs> There, that's, that's the best one I I got nothing you, you can take that one <laughs> thanks yeah, I'll, I'll forget it because yeah. of the head injury but whatever <laughs> that's probably why I can't remember any yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. oh buddy good to see you thanks for having a word with us you too buddy right Cheers. on yeah. peace Dustin Adams everybody <laughs> <laughs>